Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Stephen White, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees. And it is great to see all of you today on this amazing afternoon. The weather here is incredible. Columbus to Chicago in 30 minutes. Think about that for a minute. Whatever you may think about the future, the allure of super fast, efficient, and safe travel is a dream we have shared since our earliest, earliest history. And today we're gonna learn about the next generation and the future of transportation, not only here in Columbus, but also Ohio and the nation. So let's please provide a warm Columbus welcome to the CEO of Virgin Hyperloop One, Jay Walder. Thank you. Let's please provide another warm welcome for the CEO of COSI, our own Dr. Frederick Burtley. Frederick, the stage is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, Stephen. First of all, I'd like to begin by thanking Jane Scott and everything you do for CMC. I'm Stephen. Um, William Murdoch from Morpsey, where's William? Thank you so much for, for having this partnership happen. Um, the whole COSI team, thank you for being here. And especially two board members, Cindy Hilsheimer and Tom um, Daly, who is the board chair. Um, and I'm a very special guest from COSI, I'm Tom Davis. So thank you for being here. This is such an exciting um, time. I wanna begin with the first slide, just to level set here. So there's an exhibit called 101 Inventions That Changed the World. This is an exhibit that tours both the country as well as around the world and it highlights these amazing transformative discoveries that have moved humanity forward in powerful ways. Next slide, please. The first one is, of course, fire. Now, humans didn't invent fire, but we figured out how to harness it. And this was transformational. Not only did we cook food, which made sure we, we had healthier food and we lived longer, but also keeping us warm when it's cold. Next slide, please. The discovery of penicillin. Again, an order jump in humanity's capacity to live. Next slide, please. The discovery of the DNA, you get the theme. Next slide. Then things like communications. First, figuring out how we do smoke signals, then the telegraph seen here. Next slide. Of course, the conventional telephone. Now we can't imagine our lives without digital communication and digital technologies like cell phones. And then, of course, the fantastic power of computing and, and ones and zeros, as we like to call them at COSI. But then there's the field of transportation, a critical field that does two things moves us from one place to another place to meet people, to expand that human condition, as well as moving cargo, things that we may need to, to live. Um, next slide. Began with the discovery of the wheel, followed by something as simple as a wheelbarrow, but again, moving cargo. Then getting more clever, moving people with this horse and buggy carriage image, followed by the discovery of the Model T. And yes, there were models A through S. And then Model T democratized transportation, made cars so affordable that the average American, the average person could actually move far distances from A to B through that. Then, of course, the Wright brothers, you know, this great state, the discovery of flight, next. Then things like plane, trains, and automobiles. Next slide, please. Then there was this idea. The gentleman to my right is the architect of this idea. Next slide. I'm proud to say that that shot is of the actual pod. It's not an imitation pod. It's not a replica pod. It is the actual pod from Virgin Hyperloop. And that image, of course, was taken at COSI a few days ago. Next slide. And those of you who are online, please, you can go to Virgin Hyperloop um, One's YouTube channel to see the video, the short video we're about to play for you called Building the Dev Loop. Going up to DevLoop for the first time was seeing just unbridled opportunity. You saw the desert completely bare, and you saw in your head, in your mind's eye, what we were going to put there. I felt really confident because I have a tremendous confidence in the people that I, I work with and the people on the team that, that I helped build. We got teams from mechanical design, teams from computer engineering, and people who've worked on massive motor systems, massive rocket ships, and aerospace, aerodynamic engineering. It was actually a really cool thing to see that once we were able to give good coordination and prediction to the manufacturing team actually building the motor, you know, the construction and install team in Las Vegas was able to continue moving flawlessly and really pull in our timelines. The number of people we have in engineering and in other parts of the company that we can honestly say are the planetary masters of their art is significant. 
This thing that started as a sketch and an idea and then lived on this computer is now real and it's welded and it's bolted and you can put your hands on it, you can hammer it and then we actually assemble all the parts onto it and set it up to site and you flip the power switch and it just comes to life. The first time the pod levitated is definitely, that's the moment where it's like, oh yes, it worked. That's really the engineering dream, to get to see that whole process through. We broke all Hyperloop speed records. And to think we did all this in 10 months. We proved to the whole world that we can build safely, quickly, efficiently, and prove the technology works. This is just the beginning. Now what we're doing is we're optimizing, we're refining. So we're going to continue to do testing on that bed. We're going to do some optimization to the hardware, to the software, to the controls, to take us to the next level. I can't wait to see what we do next as a team. So this is out in the desert. It's, it's about 20 minutes outside of, uh, 30 minutes outside of Las Vegas. Uh, as you can see here, it literally starts from scratch. Um, and, and this is our company about four years ago, uh, taking components that were being developed in Los Angeles and saying, can we put this together to build the world's first full-scale Hyperloop? Um, and, and one of the things that's been my pleasure since joining the company is getting to meet all of these people. And, and what you will see in, 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 on this video is the real enthusiasm and the, and the real know-how about, about doing this. This is the clean sheet of paper, right? Nobody had done this, <clears throat> nobody had done this before, so every aspect of, of what they're doing right now, we had to figure out for ourselves in the way that we're doing it. We get up to 240 miles per hour in a 500 meter track, but I want to make that slightly more incredible for you. We had to stop. <laughs> so we really get up to 240 miles an hour in 300 meters. Uh, and, and that, the reason to see that, by the way, and the reason, how many people here, because I know enough people have been out to DevLoop, how many people here have been out to DevLoop? Uh, by the way, I think the largest contingent anywhere in the world has been out to DevLoop, perhaps including our own company, is from Ohio right now. So, so uh, <laughs> you guys win. <laughs> But, but, but I think the reason, the reason to see it is I get asked the question all the time about is it real, is it happening? Uh, it is real, it has happened. That's the tense we should be using right now. We're up to you. You got it. You got it. So um, I know normally we don't do introductions of who the guest is, but this gentleman, did just, I have to say a few words. So Mr. Walder, you used to be the chairman and CEO of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York. Small little task. CEO of the MTR Corporation in Hong Kong and then was the Managing Director of Transportation in London. He was a partner at McKinsey where he led the global infrastructure practice. He's also a professor of public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Um, he was a previous member of the Executive Board of the International Association of Public Transportation and was on the Board of Advisors at Eno Transportation. Most recently, he ran Motivate, the global leader in bike share before its sales to Lyft and is currently an advisor for Lyft. He's also on the board of Harvard um, Kennedy School of Government. His BSc is from ec in economics from State University of New York, as well as a master's in public policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government. So again, um, please warm welcome for Mr. Jay Walder. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Mr. Walder. You're going to um, call me Jay. Jay, um, you can call me Fred. <laughs> um, so all right, so um, the first question is just Level set. What is the Hyperloop? Why is this so important? Elon Musk launches challenge. Level set for the group. What we're talking about here? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we're talking effectively in a completely new mode of transportation. Uh, we are going to be running vehicles. We call them pods uh, in a depressurized environment. So in a tube, running in a pod. And here's the numbers I want you to think about. 1,000 kilometers per hour, 670 miles per hour. Um, you may ask what this is going to be like. Is it going to be a little crazy? Is it going to be bumping along? It runs with magnetic levitation, super smooth. It runs with electric propulsion, so no source emissions that are taking place in, in doing this. Um, so the way I look at it, super fast, super smooth, and meets our environmental values at the same time. 
and that's really what we should want from our transportation system right now. Great, great. So, so we know you're here, you've been here for a few days, and we hear that Columbus is the first stop on your XP1 roadshow. That's where you're showing the pod. Um, tell us more about this roadshow. Why are you doing a roadshow? Where else is it going? Yeah, so look, here's, here's why I would think about this. Uh, I was recruited to join this company uh, about eight, 10 months ago. I joined the company about eight months ago. And in the course of the conversations that we were having, uh, finally the, <clears throat> the co-founder of the company, our CTO, Josh Geigel, said, let's forget this telephone conversation we're having. You need to come to Las Vegas. And I went out to see Devlu, much like many of the people in the audience have had what, what, in doing it. Um, and it was incredibly impactful for me, just for the reasons I said. You actually get the sense that this is completely real. It's happened, 400 tests have been run, and that we're now talking about a technology that is here and now, and that we're measuring uh, in years, not measuring in decades to be able to, to do that. That changed my whole perspective of everything that we were talking about. It's one of the reasons, again, why I love the fact that many of you have been out to DevLoop, because I, because I think you come away with that feeling when you're out there and you see it in person and, and that's happening. Um, I'd love to believe that we're bringing the entire United States of America out to, to the desert in Nevada. Probably the Las Vegas uh, Tourism Commission would love that too. But um, And you can start with the whole COSI team. We'll be happy. <laughs> wanna, wanna the COSI team is very, very welcome to, uh, to be coming. But, but the thought process became, okay, we can't really do that. Maybe we could bring DevLoop to America. And so this is literally the first stop on our, on our road show. And um, <clears throat> I flew in on Sunday night, uh, the pod. We had an advanced team here. They, they were out with the pod. They were at COSI on, on Sunday. Um, and, and two things uh, were, ever, well, three things were evident, right? One, um, they were exhausted. Um, two, they were very sunburned. Um, uh, and three, they could not stop smiling and telling stories about what happened. And, and, and I, and you know this as well, they, they kept talking about people driving hours to come see this and the connection and, and people wanted to bring their kids to see this and, and know that it really is the future of what's happening. Um, that connection with people, that's what we need right now, right? That's, that, that is what should be happening so that we can all feel that it's really real in doing that. And I love the fact that we're on the roadshow. By the way, the other story you should know, uh, the pod is literally being driven here from Los Angeles to Ohio. Uh, along the way, it gets stopped by a state trooper. <laughs> um, and, and it gets pulled over, and the driver is a little nervous what's going on. And he said, you haven't done anything wrong. I just want to know what this is. <laughs> So this is, this is amazing, right? Oh, that's fantastic. Well, so we, we launched it here at COSI on Sunday. We had almost 2,000 visitors get to see the pod in real life. Um, but we know it, had others, it made some other stops in, in Columbus. Where else did it go, and, and what were the reactions? Well, uh, so in front of the State House uh, all day on Monday, that, that was terrific. Um, people just coming up all day long and seeing and being able to do it. Uh, but, but I have to say the favorite stop that, that I had we did a great stop yesterday in Dublin, and then we, we moved the pod from Dublin to, to Marysville. Um, and I'm a transportation guy, so I like everything to be on time. Uh, unfortunately, we were a little bit late. And, and we got to Marysville, and there were 250 people waiting there. Might be the entire population of the town, I don't know. Um, uh, they were all waiting there. Uh, people had brought kids. There were Boy Scout troops there. Um, people, you know, the word STEM coming out of kids' mouths, right? I mean, you know, and, and, and saying this is what I want to be involved in and doing. And it, it makes you happy to see that. It really, really makes you happy to, uh, to, to see that in, in doing it. And, and I have to say that the reception in, uh, in this region has been nothing short of phenomenal. It's really been great. No, that's fantastic. And again, kudos for doing that road trip, because you hit the nail on the head. Seeing is believing. And just by looking at that pod from the state trooper that may have stopped you to the kids who are seeing it, it really highlights their excitement around what the possibilities are around science, technology, engineering, and math. And they wouldn't get that if you were you know, cooped up just in, in Nevada. Um, so I mentioned Morpsey and, and, and William uh, Murdoch. Um, you know, what are you doing with Morpsey specific? What's that partnership like? And wh why is there cause for us in Columbus to celebrate this? So 
I'm going to tell a little story which predates me, so I'm going to do it secondhand, and William will probably tell me I got it wrong at some point. But um, <clears throat> Virgin I believe one a couple of years ago set out a global challenge. It really said, let's think about where Hyperloop could be and what cities and regions around the world, not just around the country, want to do to be able to bring Hyperloop to that, to that region. Um, and a huge number of people responded to that uh, with, with different proposals. Um, you should give this man a, a real round of applause, by the way. They had the leading proposal. So, uh, uh, and that really set off a discussion that, uh, you know, if I'm being frank, I don't know would have started another way. Um, it really gave it an energy, it gave it a basis to be able to do it. Um, and uh, they developed this idea that, that Columbus uh, could be the, the connective tissue between, between Pittsburgh on one end and, and uh, Chicago on the other end. Uh, also developing an idea about how you think about this not just on an intercity basis, but also on an intra-region basis. And, and uh, <clears throat> William and the team at Morpsey continue to press us, and one of the things uh, that they do is they, they keep coming up with ideas, that's great, uh, and they keep calling our engineers now and say, could you run the numbers so we can understand how this would work and what this would be? So the latest one that I heard about um, is probably a route that's a little bit familiar to everybody here. Uh, the John Glenn Airport to the Convention Center. Um, two minutes, 44 seconds. <laughs> now, by the way, to, to add to that, that wouldn't really matter if you said, we're going to run this like a train and we'll have a train every 45 minutes, right? That doesn't really matter if you do it. One of the beauties of what we're talking about with Hyperloop, and one of the things I would ask everybody in this room to do, is suspend your imagination of this is a fast train. It's not a fast train. It is a completely new form of transportation. That's what we have to wrap our arms around. And the reason I say this is, the model of a train, which takes lots of cars and links them together, and then says, we will run that infrequently because that's the best way to fill up the train, <clears throat> that doesn't fit with our lives. Hmm. What if we push the button for Uber or Lyft, and we said, we'll run it infrequently because that's the best way to do it, as opposed to it comes on demand when we want to do it. It does not make sense. What if Amazon said to us, well, we'll get you a package when we fill up to be able to do that, that doesn't make sense. It's not what we want to do today. Each pod is direct to the destination that it's going. Each pod holds 20 to 30 people. And the beauty of that is they're going to run incredibly frequently. And literally, in some cases, within seconds of each other to be able to do that. So, so it's not just the time of saying 2 minutes and 44 seconds. It's also the recognition that when my flight comes in to that airport, <clears throat> when I get my bag off of that carousel, I can go down there and right away I can have transportation to go where I want to go. If we're going to have 21st century transportation, we need to make sure that 21st century transportation fits the way we want to live our lives today. That's the way we live our lives and that's the way we need to design our new transportation system. Fantastic. Um, so I get this question all the time, I'm sure you do. Um, people talk about, well, it's going so fast. Do you get sick? Do you get nauseous? Um, what's the actual feel or experience like, A and B? How long do you think it'll take in years for this to be routine? I can only tell you what the engineers tell me, but they assure me that I will be able to hold a cup of coffee at 1,000 kilometers an hour and be able to drink my coffee. Uh, look, the beauty of this is um, if we were starting with steel wheels on steel rail and saying we were going to do this at 670 miles an hour, uh, I might worry about what you're going to get. But we're starting again with the most uh, recent technology. Now look, magnetic levitation exists. It exists in many places around the world. We're not reinventing magnetic levitation. We're inventing a 2019 version of magnetic levitation, but we're not reinventing something that hasn't been there before. What we know is it allows super smooth transportation. The, the system is literally floating centimeters above the rail and, and allows us to be able to do that. We will accelerate slowly 
So it is not the forces that let you go 240 miles an hour in, in, in 500 meters. We'll accelerate slowly to do that. Um, we have had some funny conversations about this. Uh, we have a project we're doing in India, and we were looking at the topography. And uh, I asked the question, could we go over the, the hill to be able to do that? Um, and the answer that came back from the engineer was, uh, absolutely, the system could do it. And I said, great. And then he said, but. <laughs> and, he, and he said, it's going to feel more like Space Mountain than you would really want. So, um, <laughs> so, so we are learning that there are certain constraints there that, that, look, there's a human experience to this. This is a system that will work for cargo. Cargo doesn't really care, but people do. Um, there's a human experience to this that we, that we have to have. We want it to be an absolutely pleasurable experience. For, for people to do. We want people to be doing it over and over again and doing it. And that's part of the requirement of what we build into what we're, what we're doing right now. Fair, but I mean, it does sound like there's an opportunity to collaborate with Disney, though. I mean, <laughs> a secondary set of incredible roller coaster feelings might, might go over well. Um, you mentioned India. Um, that's a big project. You all are either have broken ground or are breaking ground. Um, can you talk about that and talk about other um, Hyperloop activity that may be happening in the US? Sure, so, so let, let me just take the India one, and, and, it, and it's a real parallel to here, by the way. They submitted a proposal during the Global Challenge as well. Uh, this is a, a project in India from Mumbai, a city of about 20 million people, to Pune, a city of about 7 million people. Uh, by the way, much like here, the innovation in India is being led at the state level, much like it's being led in the United States at the state level. Uh, the state of Maharashtra is the, is the state that, that has both of those cities there. Um, but in India, this is a project that literally has the support of the prime minister uh, to be going forward. It's been that exciting of a project for them in, in what, they might, uh, what they might be doing. A uh, Couple things have come out very, very recently, and I think this is usually powerful. First off, and, and this is going to sound very bureaucratic and very geeky about doing it, but India has formally uh, now said that Hyperloop is an infrastructure mode in India and stands alongside roads and bridges and rail. And that makes that absolutely official in what they're doing. It's exactly what we should do in our country as well, and I hope we will do that very, very soon to be able to do it. Second of all, they are now moving forward with the final stage of a procurement process uh, in, in doing this, which we've been selected as, as the party to be able to take this process going forward. Um, and uh, <clears throat> if everything goes according to plan, we should have shovels in the ground next year. And uh, so again, uh, it's easy to think about Hyperloop as somewhere off into the future. Uh, I cannot stress enough Hyperloop is here and now. It is, it is, it is happening. It's what we should be looking at. Um, the, time, the time is really right on, on being able to do it. Uh, what's happening in the United States? Um, hey, before you get to that, because you talked about in India there was this groundswell, and now that it's a mandate, if you will, of the country, led by, perhaps by the prime minister, that this is part of India, like roads, like et cetera. Did that come out because of a movement of people were saying we have to do this, or was that top down where the government got it right away and said, hey, we're committing to that? Because as we think about how we want to embrace it in this country, how did that come about? Uh, a lot of it is bottoms up. I mean, you're, you're, you're hearing a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of enthusiasm for this. First, they have a real mobility problem. We recognize that too, right? I mean, mobility problems are all around us in, in being able to deal with it. Here's a statistic to, to think about, by the way. As you think about the world's population, 50% of the world's population lives in cities, urban areas today. The, the, the expectation is that two-thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas in 30 years. Just to put a number on this, in India, that means 300 million people are going to move into urban areas. That's the population of the United States of America. So they are looking at this and saying, we need to do things to be able to make this successful, and we want to be able uh, to make that successful. The other thing I'd say about it, and uh, it really has struck me, and some of this has struck me in my conversations that have taken place here. We're a country, when we think about ground transportation, where the vision of what we have was effectively defined in 1956. It was defined by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, by General Eisenhower. Uh, as General Eisenhower and President Eisenhower, he said, this is what we should do. And frankly, we as a country said, yes, sir. And we did it. That's what we did at that time. It was a top-down approach. It's the way that we approached it. 
and we did a fantastic job of doing it. And that's basically what defines our imagination right now. The reason why everybody in this room, if I said how far is it from Columbus to Pittsburgh, would say three hours, is because of that interstate highway system. That's defined our vision in, in doing it. But that's not the America we know today. The America we know today is actually much more driven at the state level. The innovation is much more driven at the state level. It's driven even at more local levels than that. Someone commented to me today about the fact that we're all over social media. That's the America we know today, and it's coming in that way to be able to do it. And that's what I love about this, right? Um, I spent uh, a few days in Washington a month ago. I was with the Secretary of Transportation. I was supposed to be there for 20 minutes. I was in her office for 55 minutes because she could not stop peppering with questions about this. And the reason, frankly, is not because I'm that interesting. It's because it's coming up from the bottom and they're hearing it. The representatives are hearing it. They're bringing it to, to, to the administration and they're saying we should be talking about this and we should be doing it. That's what's incredibly exciting right now. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So with that, what are other projects happening in the US related to Hyperloop? Hey, you know, we are today, there are nine different states that are studying Hyperloop across the United States. Um, uh, it's really, really exciting in, in thinking about it. This uh, road show goes from here to Texas, mm -hmm. and we will be in, we'll be in Texas. Uh, we go on to Missouri uh, after that. Uh, we'll be going in the fall to the eastern part of the United States, taking it, taking it through. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we, we were in North Carolina, and announced North Carolina is now the ninth state uh, that, is, that is doing feasibility work on uh, Hyperloop. And every state has a local flavor, and, it, and it's been one of the things that's been really special to me about this. I, I'm a kid from New York. I, I live in Los Angeles right now in, in our company. I'm the last person who should be bringing local flavor to what the Ohio proposal is. Um, that, that, that's, not, that's not me. Um, but in the conversations that I've had all around, what's been incredibly apparent in the conversation is how actually this region wraps their arms around each other and says, hey, we can do this or we can do that and there's a way to be able to leverage what we're doing over here uh, to do it. Um, on Tuesday, I, I spent time at, at TRC and with, with OSU and, and one of the things that, that really becomes clear is that it's not even a two-legged stool. We talk about public-private partnership to be able to do it. Um, that's a two-legged stool. Two-legged stools are a little shaky. Um, it's actually a three-legged stool. It's public, private, and not-for-profit in which there is a really, really serious not-for-profit sector that exists here in being able to do this and brings that along. Uh, people mention over and over again the history that exists not just in the Columbus region but across the state uh, in terms of the aerospace industry, in terms of the automotive industry that's here. You know, frankly, if you ask me right now, what are the industries that have the most applicability to Hyperloop? It's the aerospace industry and the automotive industry in being able to, to think about that. And I'm learning so much more in going around and realizing the power of what this actually means in the region and across the state in doing it, what it means for transportation, what it means for economic development, what it means for cities that are really want to be centers of a knowledge economy right now, uh, as Columbus does, are succeeding in being able to do that, but don't just need to ask themselves what we need to do to get to 2020. Columbus 2020 was great, but actually what do we need to do to be able to think out 10, 20, 30 years beyond that, and what makes Columbus a leading city as you go forward in that, in that sort of way. That's been an incredibly exciting thing for me uh, to, uh, to certainly learn. And uh, yes, in case there's any doubt, um, I now know the meaning of the phrase, the Columbus way. <laughs> so, so, so to that, and we're, we'll be taking questions in about five minutes. Um, so you mentioned nine other states. Of course, this great state of Ohio likes to be first, We're kind of first in flight. You know, first university that accepted women and persons of color right here in the great state of Ohio. So with respect to the eight other states, um, right now you have in this room the brain trust of Columbus, if you will. Um, say a little more about what we can do, how we can be active to make this happen first in the Columbus region, whether we're between Chicago and, and um, Pittsburgh. Sure. Um, and, and let me be clear about this. Um, my whole, one of my big points about being here is to work with everybody. I am committing our company 
to working with you, to working with Morpsy, to being able to figure things out. Um, the last thing in the world that I want to do, as I said, is pretend that we can sit in Los Angeles and, and, and figure this out. You figure this out by being right here, being with people and understanding and thinking about that. Uh, I, I, I really do believe that we have to bring multiple parts and, and the vision that's here together. I think clearly uh, it involves uh, the vision of roots in, in doing it, intercity, but, but even a shorter segment, what could be, you know, let, let's face it, it's, it's highly unlikely that uh, we're going to start by building a 300-mile route. Uh, much more likely that we're going to start by building something that's shorter, that be able to show value, that people become comfortable with doing that. How do we build that and, and be able to do it? Um, it's leveraging all of the sectors. Uh, government, uh, I had a fantastic meeting this morning, and, he, and he's here with the director of, of ODOT. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a tremendous enthusiasm at the state level and at the local level and the regional level to be able to do that. Lieutenant Governor, uh, the mayor of Columbus could not stop talking about this in, in being able to do it. And we, we clearly need this to be a partnership with government. I ran a company before that we talked about disruption. Sometimes we talk about disruption to government. That's called scooters. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and I hate them, but that's called scooters. Uh, this has to be disruption with government. You can't hide hundreds of miles of linear infrastructure. So this has to be disruption with government. It has to be we're doing this in, in doing that. Uh, I think the, the private sector here, which has been such a big part of initiatives that are taking place, uh, came out in force to, to be able to learn about this, to be able to talk about it. The partnership, the Chamber of Commerce, individual businesses that are there, seeing a future here in Columbus and wanting to know how do we think about what Columbus needs to do if we want more and more people here, if that's the basis of a productive knowledge economy on, on a going forward basis? And how do we do that without creating the kind of mistakes that have been made all over the world uh, in being able to do it? To, to change the paradigm that we've come to know in cities all over the country and all over the world requires something new to take place. And I think many, many people are seizing upon that. And we have to figure out a way to be able to marshal the private sector into that in doing it. Mm -hmm. And then I think third is really about how we bring academia and not-for-profit into that equation as well. Um, one of the reasons why Columbus is such a successful city right now is its partnership with academia, is the relationship to so many academic institutions that are right around here, and is the fact that young people are saying they want to stay here to, to be here in, in doing that. Um, I love the discussion we had about with the Transportation Research Center yesterday. Again, this is not a theoretical conversation. This is 45 years of history of being able to work in the transportation space right here. I love the discussion with OSU, which, which had, uh, you know, when you start talking about this as applied research and, and doing it, uh, they don't talk about it in, in a theoretical way. They take you to see the labs where they're doing this right now mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And it was a great discussion that, that took place in, in, in doing that. And I think, the, and, and, and I think the, the power of this is bringing all that together, tying that together in a way that says that this is distinctive for this region and creating a package in which we want to be able to support it from this region. The outcome of that, I think, is uh, the, the, the land use and, the, and the, the way of creating a city that fits for what goes in the future, I think it's also very much uh, a jobs ecosystem across mm -hmm. the entire state that, that actually is focused on new technology, new industry, 21st century ways of being able to do it. And when the state is working with businesses then, they're working with businesses, for example, to retool and do things not for what we should have been doing yesterday, but for what we could be doing tomorrow. Uh, that's, I think, the, the idea that, that, that is here. And um, I, I come away incredibly energized uh, from my visit here. That's probably obvious to everybody. The people have, have talked to me and, and doing it. Uh, we want to work with people to be able to, to do that. Um, look, uh, we've only known each other a little while, but I wouldn't kid you. Yes, I am going to other places, and I want to see them be energized, too. Mm -hmm. And that's my job. I have to do that. It's my responsibility. But we will be here alongside Morpsy and the people here to try to develop for you what could be the very, very best proposal for how we say we bring Hyperloop here. The last point I make about that, by the way, it is up for grabs. I know that this is the, the home of uh, the Wright brothers. 
but the license plate first in flight actually exists in a different state. So first in Hyperloop is up for grabs right now. <laughs> you got it, you got it. Well, look, I mean, I appreciate that perspective, and, and you know, this, this room will confirm that, that this great state has both the DNA and the infrastructure to pull this off. I mean, you have to remember, this is the state that produced the person who was the first person in the world to successfully orbit planet Earth. It's also the great state that produced the first person who walked on the moon. So I think we can get the Hyperloop if we can do that. I hope so. So um, with that, we have a series of a bunch of folks who are ready to ask some good questions. I'd ask that you state your name if you represent an organization, your organization, and please keep your question as succinct as possible. Thank you. Yes, my name is Warren Fishman, and I'm really excited that you're here. And and um, uh, I have thank you. Two oh, oh, you mean him? Sorry. I, I, oh, yeah. I, 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 I think he's a I'm doubly I'm excited. <laughs> uh, I, I have two questions actually, but uh, the first question is: uh, When I got a cell phone in 1981, there was all this talk about the cell phone waves causing cancer. Um, and of course, it, I guess it hasn't proven to be that, but um, have we done studies on the uh, effect on the human body with the magnetic field um, uh, uh, so we get rid of that fear? And my next most important question is, when will the pod be leaving from central Ohio? If everything goes well, uh, have you made, had pro made projections on, is it 10 years, is it five years, is it three years, or what is it? So, so uh, I think studies have been done. I, I won't quote them, but, but I think we, we really are talking about a safe environment to be able to, to do this. Let me take the second part of the, the, the question, and I'll point you to the, the India project. We expect to finish all of the work on the procurement of that India project in the end of this year. We'll be shovels in the ground next year. We will have completed a, a 12 kilometer phase one within two years, and we'll be in the, the test and certification process right after that. Um, that's the time frame I'd like us to be, to be trying to work toward uh, in doing this. I think that we can be working in parallel on, on the route or routes that we're doing, as well, on the, as, well as the work with, with ODOT and the, the, the Federal Department of Transportation to be able to, to certify this and have it go. And one thing we should avoid right now is creating a series of, of consecutive or sequential steps. Uh, we can move in parallel, we can do things in parallel, we are a privately funded company who wants to work hand in hand with people to be able to do it in that way, and we should take advantage of that. Great. Thank you for your question. Next, sir. So, so how many years? <laughs> uh, look, I think, I think from, from when, when we put shovels in the ground to when you will uh, complete that whole process is, is, is really three or four years to be able to have a first phase of what you're able to do. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Leach. I'm the Director of Research and Policy at the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. Uh, my question is, for this project to actually get constructed, will you need state funding or any tax incentive packages? And how do you plan on engaging a rural dominated legislature here in Ohio who may be resistant to funding anything that will benefit the cities? Uh I certainly expect that this project, if it goes forward, will be some form of a public-private partnership that takes place. Uh, I almost challenge anyone to think about any infrastructure that we're building in, in our country that is not some form of public-private partnership. And by the way, my background in government, I actually believe that's the right thing for government to do. It's, it's what we should be facilitating. The answer, the answer to your second question, I think, comes from, from the fact that we need, to create a, we need to create a message here and a deliverable here that actually shows benefits to the, to the state of Ohio, not just to the Columbus region. I think that's usually important in doing it. Certainly the message around jobs is a message that goes to the entire state, and the way in which you can begin to think about this starting and then filtering out to, to all parts of the state are, uh, is really incredible. Um, this state and, and you know, the director uh, of DOT made this point very clearly this morning. Uh, this state has an incredible amount of vehicle miles traveled that are actually taking place in the state, both for passenger travel and for freight, and this is a system that does, that does both. Um, the benefits of actually being able to move people cheaply, quickly, in an environmentally friendly way in this state, and move some of that off of the modes that we're doing right now, and further solidify the role that, that Ohio ha has in the center of such a large, large region of the United States, um, is actually what the benefit is to the state, and that's the way we should be thinking about it. Perfect. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Lorna 
Closer. Okay. Um, my name is Nidhi Satyani. I work in healthcare, and so I apologize for the redundancy. But would you mind talking a little bit about the studies that are being done on how this is impacting the human body and what questions are still outlying? Uh, I can't talk in detail about the study okay. about the studies right now, but but there have been a whole series of studies that have actually been been done on it. Uh, we can share some of that some of that work. I, I actually believe that what we're talking about here, um, in many ways, may well be the safest mode of transportation that that we have. We're talking about a dedicated right of way to be able to do it. We eliminate many of the issues that come from the intersection of technology in people in ways that, that are a little more uncontrolled in, in being able to do it. We eliminate all grade crossings and, and ways of doing it, so we, we separate in, in doing that. Um, and we are really working off the, the most advanced command and control system that, that we could have to be able to do it. Um, when we think about railways, we really start with what was really traditional railway signaling in the 1800s, and we've evolved it over time. Rather than starting with that incremental approach, we start from the other end and are able to say, how do we make this happen with a really, really clean sheet of paper? Sure. And I'll just add, I mean, for the last 50 years or so, we've been working with MRI technology, which is massive magnetic, right, and um, completely safe. So, so I'm sure you're leveraging a lot of that, that work that's been done before. Thank you. So, thank you for the question. Next question. Good afternoon, I'm Kathy Fox with the Pizzuti Companies. My question is how this technology and transportation mode will integrate with other transportation modes that already exist in our community, and how are you looking at um, connections and multimodal uh, trips? Uh, thank you, and, and, and that's, your question is an indication I should have spoken to that, so thank you very much. I think that's a usually important part. I think. Um, Hyperloop has to be complementary to other transportation modes that are there. Um, I frankly feel that if we move Hyperloop or believe we're moving Hyperloop into every single community, we will fail. I think what we have to be able to think about is how Hyperloop is in certain places and how we're using other transportation to be able to move people to Hyperloop rather than building Hyperloop in every community to be able to do it. I think the other part of it, though, that I would say is uh, I hope that it's also the enabler of changing the pattern of development that takes place and allowing us to have increasing density around transportation hubs to be able to do it. As we look forward, that has to be a way that, that, that cities succeed to be able to do that. And um, uh, as I said before, just doing what we've been doing and expect that we won't end up with urban sprawl and all the difficulties that have come with that, I think is a mistake. Uh, we must approach this in a very, very different way. The beauty of Hyperloop, I think, is that the value that it is providing to people is so great that it allows us to perhaps be a fulcrum for that step change in terms of land use and density and the way in which we might think about this on, on a going forward basis. Hi, uh, Rob Morris, IOTO Analysis. Uh, thanks for coming and talking about this really exciting technology. Um, I know you said that uh, Hyperloop is not rail, and there's definitely some technical differences between those, but I'm sure you have been focusing on some of the troubles that the United States has had with high-speed rail over the past 20 years and trying to use that as a way to learn. Um, I was really disappointed in 2011 when Ohio gave up on high-speed rail, and even more disappointed this year, earlier this year when California had to give up on high-speed rail after years and years of going through that process. I have a good friend who worked for the California Auditor's Office and was involved in auditing that process and just saw how high those costs got. So I just wanted to ask you, what kind of steps are y'all taking to make sure that this project is not oversold or really undersold when it comes to costs to your public partners um, to make sure that this, is, that this can actually be feasible? Um, really very quickly, three things that, that go there. Uh, first off, I think in, in terms of the value proposition that's there to people, the fact that it's three times as fast as even high-speed rail, the fact that it creates a direct-to-destination route to be able to do that, the fact that it runs incredibly frequently to be able to do it, creates a different value proposition than we have with, with high-speed rail right now, which I think we can leverage in what we're doing. Second, one of the big determinants of success and, and one of the difficulties in California clearly was land 
and, and the ability to have right of way. And again, I think Ohio is in a, in a place right now um, where you have the ability to be able to set aside right away if one wants to set aside right away to do it. Those first two points are connected. We will not set aside, you will not set aside right away unless you believe there's real value to being able to do it. So those first two are, are really connected points. Third, uh, it is actually cheaper to build Hyperloop than it is to build high-speed rail. In part, that's because the tube is smaller. Um, in part, because it's, it's able actually to navigate terrain a little differently than high-speed rail does. So, so it's cheaper to build and it's cheaper to operate. There are no moving parts with high-speed with with Hyperloop. Uh, high-speed rail suffers, uh, unfortunately, with the fact that you literally have to move the track to be able to turn. There are a lot of moving parts that are associated with that. There's a lot of difficulty in doing that. Um, <coughs> this system is actually cheaper to build and cheaper to operate in, in doing it. And, and really the fourth thing, and I'll, I'll bring it to the value proposition again, uh, it's more environmentally friendly. So, so you know, on all the things that we should be looking at, I think we're creating a proposition that people can get behind to be able to do it. But we should be guided by, oh, and I, let me add one more, and, and I'm sorry, I, I should have said this. <clears throat> because it's a big one. High-speed rail is not in a U.S. technology. It's not an American technology to be able to do it. If you're going to put a high-speed rail system in the United States of America, it will be built in China, Japan, Korea, uh, France, or Germany. I guarantee you that in doing it. That's the case. What we are talking about today is how we leverage U.S. technology, American innovation to be able to do something for our country and create the jobs right here in terms of being able to do it. And I also believe that's part of the proposition that we need to get behind as well. Right. Um, there is literally two more minutes left, so the last two folks, please get your questions in. Thank you. Um, John McKnight, uh, owner of Lucky Dog T-shirts. Um, is this gonna be affordable for your average person to use? It's gotta be a tremendously expensive, you know, given you just said it's cheaper than high-speed rail. Um, I can't imagine this is an inexpensive undertaking. Um, is it, have there been forecasts done? Am I going to be able to afford to, to, to buy a ticket to use this, or is it going to just be sort of like the space travel thing that's, you know, uh, really just for the, you know, the ultra wealthy? Thank you. You know, when I started in transit, uh, we, we use the term today public transit, but I actually prefer, because it's a word that I used when I started, unfortunately, I'm that old, but, but uh, it's mass transit. This has to be a, a system for people, for a lot of people to be able to use. I think your question is right on point. Uh, about that. We have not done a study uh, with MORPSI looking specifically at the, at the cost here, but I will tell you about another study that was done looking at the, by a company called Black & Veatch, an engineering firm in, in Kansas. Uh, they did a study looking at the cost between St. Louis and Missouri, about a three and a half hour trip by car, and they said they estimate that the cost of a Hyperloop ride <clears throat> would be roughly equivalent to the cost of a, of a tank of gas. So I, I do think that we're in a place where we are looking at, at this as a a system that is affordable to people. It has to be affordable to people. Our value proposition to ourselves as a company in terms of the impact that we want to have is not to create a luxury product, but to create a product that has real impact, that people are able to use, and that changes the way that we think about moving around our regions and our country. Thank you, and last question, sir. Floor is Thank yours. you. I'm Jim Bruner. I work with the PASS Foundation, and the, our organization is committed to the intersection of culture and applied STEM and technology. So my question to you is, our kids are really interested in the emerging infrastructure, which you call the knowledge uh, economy, which is brilliant, by the way. I love that. But my question is, are there any opportunities for kids and young adults coming up to apply fourth industrial revolution principles like 3D printing to make this even more efficient? I watched your video and I saw you're using traditional robot welding and manufacturing. But are there horizons for 3D printing and that kind of autonomous technology for building this to lower cost? Absolutely, and, and I have to say, <clears throat> my visit to OSU yesterday and being able to walk through some of the labs that, that were at OSU and showing some of the work that they've been doing, uh, visiting this morning with uh, uh, another company in, uh, in Columbus here who made a point about welding and, and about the technology that's being done in, in, in welding. Uh, the opportunities for this are incredible. Uh, we are deeply, by the way, committed as a company to working with young people as well and to bringing people in. We've just had about 20 interns from around the, around the country who have been in our office. By the way, to be clear about this, <clears throat> these are incredibly talented people who could have gone anywhere. 
we, we really don't pay interns to be in our office, and they wanted to be there because they felt they learned so much in doing this, and we want to support them in, in doing that, and I hope many of them will come back and actually join our company uh, to do this. So I, I think STEM is hugely important right now. I think innovation is hugely important in the way that we're, we're thinking about it, and we want to leverage the innovation that's taking place in, in other places. We cannot be the company that's creating innovation across the entire spectrum of what's going on. We should be leveraging it to what we're doing. To partner with you. That's Thank the future you. we want to see as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. White. All right. Well, uh, well, I hope you found today's forum inspiring. You know, it's, it's um, you know, it's great to see that the Central Ohio region is embracing that three legs of the stool that you talked about, the public, private, and also nonprofit sector to continue to lead the way. And then we also want to thank you, Jay, and the entire Hyperloop One team for ignoring the box and thinking about how to move, uh, move us forward. But I do have one question for you, uh, one last question. If it goes in a straight line, why do you call it a loop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> so just, you got to be the stumper at the just, end. Just had, just had to ask that one question. So. The world is round. Uh, but let's give one last thank you to our partners, COSI and Morpsey, as well as our speakers, Mr. Jay Walder and Dr. Frederick Bertley. <laughs> Frederick? And one last thing, while, while you were bashful and shy, I didn't want to ask you the question about why it's called a loop. Because you guys want to connect planet Earth, and eventually it has to go around and do it. Ah, there you go. Oh, there you there go. Fantastic. Brought to you by Cosi. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and on that note, we want to. Again soon. <laughs> and on that note, we also want to thank all of you uh, for being here today. We look forward to seeing you next week at CMC. Thank you. All right. Thank you.